One of my favorite scenes in Game of Thrones highlights just how intelligent Tywin Lannister is. That scene takes place in the Sept of Baelor, over Joffrey's cold corpse. Tywin asks Tommen, what makes a good king? I'm gonna play the full scene here first, then deliver my analysis. Your brother is dead. Do you know what that means? I'm not trying to trick you. It means I'll become king. Yes, you will become king. What kind of king do you think you'll be? A good king? Hmm. I think so as well. You've got the right temperament for it. But what makes a good king? Hmm? What is a good king's single most important quality? This is hardly the place of the time. Holiness? Hmm. Baelor the Blessed was holy. And pious, he built this sept. He also named a six-year-old boy High Septon because he thought the boy could work miracles. He ended up fasting himself into an early grave because food was of this world and this world was sinful. Justice. Yeah. Good king must be just. Oris I was just. Everyone applauded his reforms, nobles and commoners alike, but he wasn't just for long. He was murdered in his sleep after less than a year by his own brother. Was that truly just of him, to abandon his subjects to an evil that he was too gullible to recognize? No. No. What about strength? Yes, strength. King Robert was strong. He won the rebellion and crushed the Targaryen dynasty. And he attended three small council meetings in 17 years. He spent his time pouring and hunting and drinking until the last two killed him. So, we have a man who starves himself to death, a man who lets his own brother murder him, and a man who thinks that winning and ruling are the same thing. What do they all lack? Wisdom. Yes. Wisdom is what makes a good king. Yes. But what is wisdom, hmm? A house with great wealth and fertile lands asks you for your protection against another house with a strong navy that could one day oppose you. How do you know which choice is wise and which isn't? You, any experience of treasuries and granaries or shipyards and soldiers? No. No, of course not. A wise king knows what he knows and what he doesn't. You're young. A wise young king listens to his counselors and heeds their advice until he comes of age. And the wisest kings continue to listen to them long afterwards. Your brother was not a wise king. Your brother was not a good king. If he had been, perhaps he'd still be alive. Now, as the king, you will have to marry. Do you understand why? The king needs a queen. Yes, but why? To further the family line. Do you know how that happens? Yes. Yes, but has anyone explained the detail to you? I don't think so. It's all relatively straightforward. How are you? I'm all right. You are. You will be. I'll see to that. Please give the Queen a moment alone with her For context, let's note the following. Tywin's typical form of manipulation is intimidation. I am Queen Regent, not some brood man. You're my daughter! He yells. He commands. He administers the most merciless of death stares. He's always aware of the spatial aspects of power and the role of physicality in status. He does not rely on excessive speech, but nonetheless articulates himself very sharply. 
Any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king. And everybody does what Tywin says, because everybody knows he's willing to back it up with deadly force. But how do you manipulate a gentle, sensitive young boy who'd rather pet a kitten than rule the Seven Kingdoms? Tywin's typical strategies wouldn't work. Tommen would probably just cry and become scared of his grandfather and avoid him. Here is a chance to reveal whether Tywin is a one-note, brutal intimidator or an adaptable tactician who simply happens to be very intimidating. We see very quickly that the latter is the case. Tywin slowly guides Tommen into becoming his pawn by letting him do it himself. He knows that excessive pressure would alienate Tommen, he knows that his typical intimidation isn't warranted, and he knows that Tommen is well aware that everybody now wants to manipulate him. Hence Tywin saying, I'm not trying to trick you. Because if Tommen feels in control and not threatened, he's putty in Tywin's hands. Therefore, Tywin doesn't directly tell him anything. He asks and guides. He uses a chain of leading questions in a style that's almost Socratic, letting Tommen stumble onto the conclusions that Tywin wants. We see that Tywin, as powerful as he is at delivering commands, is every bit as effective when asking questions. That kind of adaptability, coupled with all of Tywin's other tactical skill, is a mark of genius. And aside from all the clever subtextual manipulation here, let's pay attention to the actual progression of the conversation. Tywin is able to narrate a historical counterexample to every suggestion Tommen gives. Coming up with relevant, illustrative anecdotes off the top of your head to reinforce one central point, that's not easy at all. It requires a vast amount of reading and knowledge of history, as well as the mental quickness to relevantly recall it, as well as the strategic and organizational attention to make it support your overarching narrative. That's why Robert Greene did years of research to write the 48 Laws of Power, which, by the way, is incredibly relevant to this scene, Tywin's character, and Game of Thrones itself. I'll probably write more on Tywin in the future, on his intimidation tactics and his moral values, but until then, here are some other things I like about this scene. Tywin's genuine, grandfatherly demeanor. Charles Dance once said that he didn't view Tywin as a bad guy, and I don't fully disagree. One interpretation of the scene is that Tywin actually does see the potential for greatness in Tommen, and wants to educate him to be a great king for many years to come, regardless of his own objectives. Another thing, Cersei's pathetic inability to control her son's attention or the direction of the conversation only magnified by the cold corpse she's standing over, a testament to her failures as a mother and a disciplinarian. The foreshadowing of Tommen eventually ceding control to the High Sparrow, when his first idea of a good king is holiness. And Tywin beginning to give Tommen the sex talk because he wants to become a great-grandfather as soon as possible. Do you know how that happens? Yes. Yes, but has anyone explained the detail? I don't think so. It's all relatively straightforward. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Lots of content to come. Subscribe if you're interested in moral, philosophical, and psychological breakdowns of fiction. Until next time...